Welcome to the Pod of Inquiry, pushing the envelope for human understanding and optimization, the podcast for podiatrists. The Pod of Inquiry is designed to empower you with knowledge. What happens from there is up to you. Your host, Dr. Stephen Barrett, has designed this show to take you down some very deep rabbit holes, hopefully bringing you back out again, relatively unscathed, but cerebrally whipped, enabling a better understanding of all things worthy of inquiry. If you have more questions after the show, then that is good. The new discovery today, many times, was the new discovery 50 years ago, only to be suppressed or plainly ignored. Medicine and surgery can sometimes take a long while to get their paradigm shifted. We hope to have a lot of fun on this show and maybe destroy some ridiculous dogma along the journey. Thanks for joining the show today. Let's start spelunking. Dr. Alan Christensen is a Phoenix, Arizona-based naturopathic endocrinologist with a focus on thyroid disease. He is a New York Times bestselling author whose titles include The Metabolism Reset Diet and The Thyroid Reset Diet. Dr. Christensen is the founding president of the Endocrine Association of Naturopathic Physicians and is the founding co-president of the American College of Thyroidology. He frequently appears on national TV shows like Dr. Oz, The Doctors, The Today Show, and CNN, as well as print media like Shape Magazine, Women's World, and Natural Health. I have known Dr. Christensen for many years since he became a patient of mine, and then I became a patient of his. I have referred to many patients with very complex heavy metal toxicities, and they have done very well under his care. He's a brilliant and very interesting guy, and I know you will enjoy our conversation about thyroid function and his new best-selling book, The Thyroid Reset Diet. Dr. Alan Christensen, welcome. It's been a while since we've chatted. Great to see you. Good to see you too, Dr. Steve Barrett. Happy to be with you today. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've got to preface everything first with the fact that um, I'm sitting here talking to a, a New York Times bestseller, I think, more than once, right? Yep. Seven titles out now. Wow. I have three of them, and we'll talk mostly about your new thyroid reset diet today. Uh, I, it was funny. I was looking around in my library a couple of months ago before I reached out to you, and I had found the book that you had written, The Idiot's Guide to Thyroid. Yeah, and I, I think, when. Yeah, I think I had that way before you, you became a patient of mine back in okay. the day. And uh, I don't know what year that was, but uh, I didn't even really... It's like, wait, oh, that's Dr. Christensen. It was like, you know, uh, but that that's a great little book. I mean, that uh, really, I think, uh, distills the information really well. And I we're going to talk a lot about your uh, your new thyroid diet reset book. But uh, anyhow, so so the audience can get a, an appreciation of your journey because I think your journey is is very interesting, and uh, you preface your books with what really was the impetus to make you get to this point. So do you want to share that? I think that really provides a great framework. Sure, sure. Yeah, I uh, really struggled with my health earlier in life and got to experience, you know, what a big deal it is when things don't work the way you want and when it, how frustrating it can be when you don't get clear answers or you get conflicting advice. Um, I had uh, seizures as a kid, secondary to cerebral palsy was the expectation. And some combination of that and whatever other factors, I was just uh, obese by the time I was an adolescent. I was very heavy and physically uncoordinated. Uh, and, you know, ostracized, this was back in the, the mid-70s where, I mean, now we talk about fat shaming. Way back when, there was fewer people that were really heavy. And the, there was no phrase for fat shaming because it wasn't a bad thing. It was just okay and accepted and normal. That was right. just what you did. Yeah. But, but yeah, I really felt compelled to try to change my health. And I connected with some authors at the time who had written books about changing your diet and things along those lines, gradually exercising. And the experience was that it was the most life-changing thing, but there was also some disillusionment in that I had gone to doctors and I, the help that I got wasn't from them. It was more so the things I learned and that I applied. So it really made me want to help bridge the gap between what is known and what can be done and also to help that amongst professionals. 
So you were pretty young when that that journey started, where you just decided I wanted to change my physical uh, status, right? I was twelve, you know, and wow. I, I was a I was a little nerdy kid. I was always reading books about space and science. And one of my trips to the library, after being called out for my shape and teased and stuff, I I said, you know what, I've got to learn something else. I got to learn more about how to how I can be healthier and how I can fit in better. And so that led me to the whole health section, and been at that ever since. Yeah, and that that really shaped getting you into you know what you did as far as your practice, and then writing your books and educating people, and you know so that's really a great um, a great way to I guess start down a path, right? You don't realize how much you can do for other folks had you not done what you did for yourself. So right. All right. Well, let's get into a little bit of thyroid. Um, we'll call it thyroid 101. It's always great to get a little bit of a refresher. I think you made some really great points in your book about, um, well, I, you know, everything, but, you know, like T4 ratio to, to T3 ratio being 10 to 1. Why don't you just start talking a little bit about thyroid um, from a general foundational standpoint, and then we'll kind of dissect it a little bit more if needed. Yeah, for sure. The, the first thing I bring about is some framing about where we are today and the relevance of this topic. So there's like the Casey Kasem's top 40, right? They, they right. put out reports each year about top prescribed medications. And the pandemic changed a few things, of course, but prior to then it was pretty stable. So the, the top three positions, one of those three would be third medication year okay. after year after year after year, oftentimes number one. And this is true globally. So that's one piece of data, like most widely prescribed medication. Now, another piece of data is the prevalence and the rate of autoimmune persistent thyroid disease, thyroid cancers, thyroid structural diseases. They've gone up markedly. The big window has been somewhere around uh, mid-80s, early 90s to present. That's when the inflection point was hit, and it's really been picking up since then. Now, the third data point of relevance is some really big surveys. The American Third Association did one in 2018, over 12,000 people on their site. And it was looking at how satisfied patients are with their care. You know, this wouldn't be report cards you'd put up on the refrigerator. Uh, it really, it, it tanked. Uh, people commonly seek out six to 10 doctors. Uh, people rate their satisfaction at a three out of 10 on average. So... This is a lot of people, it's more people, and what's being done right now is not sufficient. Well, you pointed out in your book, I thought it was very interesting how that thyroid uh, conditions have exponentially increased um, correlative to the implementation of putting more iodine in the diet, uh, kind of like a uh, the law of unintended co consequences here. So kind of frame that because, I, I mean, you point out that, what, probably 30 million Americans now have thyroid disease of some form or fashion? Yeah, at least they're diagnosed. So yeah. the paradox, the thyroid's a little thing that controls a lot in the body. Uh, the nervous system, you know, how much of our functionality depends upon a healthy neurologic state? You know, conduction within the brain, conduction outside the body, pain signals, movement signals, these are central to our quality of life. And how quickly those reactions occur and the impulses are sent are controlled by many factors, but top of the list can be the amount of thyroid hormones. So when these alter, we can't think well, we can't send signals through our body properly. So that's a big thing. They control how quickly we burn energy. How will we repair our connective tissues? So this comes up a lot in structural medicine and overlapping with the nerve conduction. We can't repair things well if there's not the right balance of thyroid hormones. And then also they have effects upon how we're using other hormones and whether they're in a good state of balance or not. These are the big things it does. And its main operation is by releasing energy by dropping iodine off of certain positions. You talked about right. T3 and T4. These are three and four iodine atoms on a protein. So the forming of hormones is stacking on iodine, and the using of hormones is the releasing of it. So yeah, that's a very central part of thyroid metabolism. So you uh, pointed out in the book that um, that until recently, it wasn't believed that the thyroid could regenerate. And yeah. 
you know, as with any other organ or tissue in the body, it all everything has a a turnover. There's cellular death and cellular regrowth. And it, it's interesting to me why they would think that the thyroid wouldn't have capabilities to regenerate. Yeah, you're right. Everything is always new cells and old cells. The old idea was really wrapped up in the nature of thyroid autoimmunity. So thyroid disease, you know, three high-level categories. There's diseases of structure, diseases of function, and diseases of inflammation. So the most common thing by far is an inflammatory autoimmune state called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which causes inadequate output of thyroid hormone. So thyroid disease as a generalization, that's, that's the bulk of it. And we used to think that once this pathway got going, it would persist and that the immune system would, would, never, would never stop attacking the thyroid cells as long as it could. But now we know that if the conditions change, if the main driver of autoimmunity is no longer present, the attack does stop. And barring the cases to where there's been severe atrophy of the gland, it can regenerate for the large majority of, of people. So you point out in the book that, I mean, you point out a lot of things. So um, we we have basically hypothyroid conditions and hyperthyroid. And for all intents and purposes, hyperthyroid, Graves' disease, they're percentage-wise, they're relatively small compared to the hypothyroid. So we're going to be focusing on hypothyroid, I would assume, as you did in your book, right? Mm -hmm. So if this, and, and I don't know how much of the hypothyroid cases are really Hashimoto's. It's a, it's a large percentage, you point out, but I don't recall what percentage you said. You know, I've, I've often estimated 95, yeah. 97%. The difficulty wow. is Hashimoto's is ultimately a histologic diagnosis. So there's no rule out short of biopsy, biopsy. analysis. And that's right. just not done clinically. So antibodies, you know, measured serum thyroid antibodies, they can, one, one way to confirm Hashimoto's, but their absence does not rule out Hashimoto's. And many who have it do not have measurable antibodies. Okay. So really, if we know someone's hypothyroid and there's not another obvious reason, we assume that it's Hashimoto's. So you also pointed out in your book, which I found very interesting, that you can, with your diet, and we'll talk more specifically about your, your diet in a little bit, but you can improve the condition greatly and the antibodies may not drop lab-wise. Did I get that wrong? No, you didn't. In many cases, they do from these same steps, but not always. And the antibodies, it's funny. They have a strong correlation with thyroid disease, but not a perfect one. There are, there's, there's variations to thyroid antibodies, some of which are not clinically relevant and some of which can become less relevant. So the antibodies can become harmless even if they, be, if, even if they remain measurable. <laughs> so you're saying if we do get that thyroid back into uh, better shape by what we're going to talk about with the iodine, then whether or not there's an antibody there or not, that cell is still healthy and producing normal amounts of thyroid hormones. Is that correct? Right? Okay. Uh, so when we look at these patients from a laboratory standpoint, you point out, you pointed out really well in your, your idiot's guide. I don't know why I resonate so much with that idiot's guide, but uh, maybe it was just more on my sink. <laughs> but <laughs> the, uh, you point out that the, um, Hashimoto's may have a genetic precursor. Have have they identified any particular SNPs yet that are that you can look at on a you know a genetic test that you know it's it's interesting. There's about like a dozen different ones that we can talk about, and they they have some predictive value, but not perfect. They're mostly X-linked. There's a lot of overlap between those and the ones that are associated with Graves' disease. What they do though is they change the way that we metabolize iodine. And the variety of SNPs basically make two different uh, patterns uh, of, of how the body metabolizes iodine. I call them the, the spenders and the sabers. So okay. one, one pattern is the, the method of which the body can tolerate a lot of iodine and get rid of it. So we think humans were in two very different environments when it came to iodine. Those were close to the ocean and those that weren't. So those that got a lot of food from the ocean they had a stable amount, but they occasionally got a lot. And right. so they got good at dumping the excess. They're the spenders. Now, those who were far away from the oceans, 
they could do really well on a spec and they got really good at getting by in small amounts. But to do that, they compromised their ability to dump the excess. So they're the sabers. Yeah, so some people, the tolerance is different. The requirements are about the same regardless of genes, but per gene differences, some people have different tolerances for extra amounts of iodine. So you made the correlation, well, you didn't, but you pointed it out very aptly that as different countries started to address this iodine deficit, for lack of a better way to put it, the cases of hypothyroid shot way up. Hashimoto's everything. Um, Tell us a little bit about that, the Denmark study. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, so when I... When I think about how we know what's what's happening, I always think of like a, a convergence of lines of evidence. So we want some clear mechanism of action. Ideally, we also have some interventional trials. And now we're talking about the epidemiologic side. And ideally, these things converge. So the epidemiologic side, back in 24, we started a voluntary program, 1924, voluntary program of iodizing salt. And this was kicked off near the near the Great Lakes, near Michigan. And this was not far from the original Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. They happened to be tracking rates of various diseases. And what they saw was that the rate of autoimmune thyroid disease amongst the main demographics, this is more common amongst women. It's especially common in the third, fourth, and fifth decade. And in this demographic, the rate of autoimmune thyroid disease went up 52-fold in the decade after iodine fortification. There was Doctors were raging about this. They're saying this is a new thing. We hadn't had this before. This was a bad move. And it was obvious how radically the rate changed. So in that, you know, period of where these correlations were made, there were, there had to be a lot of other things going on, environmental toxins, just, you know, I I would think myriad factors can play into the development of hypothyroidism. For sure. And that was one, that was one small case study. So It's been now tracked, and honestly, without exception, every nation that has fortified their iodine with salt, they've decreased pediatric goiter when that that was a factor that's been positive, but they've increased chronic adult thyroid disease. You mentioned Denmark. They were one of the more recent to do it, and they did it with probably the best level of scrutiny. You know, they have centralized medicine, so they can very easily track trends of uh, diagnoses, prescriptions, procedures. And they did a flawless job with their fortification. In many cases, when it was fortified, it was not at the target amounts. It might have been excessive. But they wanted to have the median intake go up by about 50, 50 micrograms per day. And they basically nailed it. But that happened in 2000. And the last data points I saw were from 2019. But for every year after fortification, they saw year after year increases of uh chronic adult thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, uh, eventually thyroid cancer started picking up, Graves' disease, uh, toxic nodules, and also goiter. So steady year after year increases. So let's, let's go back to the physiology of this, because I think it's real interesting from you know, a cellular standpoint. So the iodine, so I guess we have this pump that, that pumps the, iod, the sodium iodide through into the follicular cells of the thyroid? And then does it become iodine then? Is, it, is that the process where, where it goes through that pump where it, it's converted into more of a reactive form? You're exactly right. So think of iodine like an antiseptic because it is. You know, bleach, right. peroxide, it's highly oxidative. And we often say iodine loosely, but you're right. So iodide is the reduced form. And that's the form that we almost always find it in. So the body very carefully oxidizes it in controlled settings. So we have a pump, the sodium iodide symporter, and that helps iodine achieve a certain concentration. Then we have an enzyme thyroid peroxidase, and that oxidizes it and turns iodide into iodine. Once it's made into iodine, there's a certain number of spots on which it would ideally sit. There's a protein called thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin has 13 tyrosol residues that are designated for iodine attachment sites. When they get filled up, these things flex together and they form the precursors to the active thyroid hormones, which are brought outside the cells and into the bloodstream. The problem is that when there's a little bit too much iodine present, those 13 spots are filled, but other molecules, diatomic iodine, will attach onto other parts of that molecule of thyroglobulin. And 
they create free radical damage, they cause antigenicity. They cause thyroglobulin to appear foreign to the immune system. So then, I think you said uh, the T4 normally handles about, what, four to six uh, iodine atoms or... Well, four. That, that, four? That's the four. That's it. Okay. Yep. I guess Easy it's the, th- the thyroglobulin is... Yeah. Can, yeah. And, and then in Hashimoto's, it can have up to like 60... Yeah, yeah. So the 13 was those tyrosol residues. Okay. In states of hyper iodinated thyroglobulin, you might have 60 atoms jammed on there somewhere. So think about like all the clowns piling into a little bus. It's it's something like that. The seats are filled and then some. And and they're inflammatory clowns. They're inflammatory clowns. They're damaging right. the upholstery, you know, <laughs> they're causing various problems there. And so when we're looking at this and we get their 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 thyroid tests back, and you recommend that you run the free T3, free T4, the uh, uh, TSH, obviously, you want to see the feedback loop there. Um, and then you also want to look at your uh, uh, thyroid antibodies and the uh, thyroid peroxidase. So give us a little primer on that. How, and it, it, you talk about narrow band and broadband values. And yeah. we see this in everything. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. over the last 30 years, all of the lab references have become what I call more unhealthy. So yeah, give us give us a little bit on that, what you look for. Um, you know, we see this patient with peripheral neuropathy and we do all of these these uh, lab tests and thyroids always in there. How do we how should we dial in on the, the thyroid labs? Yeah, two super big pieces of relevance. So relative to nerve function, anytime that you're not in a good, healthy range, your thyroid can be affecting that. Now, there's two ways that can happen. That can be the wrong amount of hormone or the inflammatory response. An emerging thing we're seeing a lot of lately is that the autoimmune component, we used to always think that it was a problem to the extent to which it screwed up the thyroid. Now we know that even before there's an alteration in thyroid function, the autoimmunity by itself can cause problems. And that includes some of these neurologic issues. So you can have too much, too little, and or abnormal thyroid antibodies. But any combination of that can be neurologically problematic. So let's talk about the general symptoms that you see. And I think you made a great point in the book that you can see sometimes the same symptoms, whether they're hypo or hyperthyroid. So let's talk about the general symptoms. What what you see, I mean, you talk about the dry skin, you know, the interruption of peristalsis in the gut, these, these different types of things. Obviously, anxiety and depression are a big part. Yeah, the high-level idea is just bear in mind the physiology of this. So you have metabolic rate, uh, tissue repair, nerve conduction, all the things that center around that. So the metabolic rate, the, the, the weight struggles. So if someone puts on weight more easily, it doesn't come off without extreme things that are not healthy. Uh, subjective fatigue, both muscular cognitive fatigue are quite common with that. Uh, hair, hair thinning, more so diffuse and even, not so much like androgenetic and not so much patchy or whatnot. Uh, then we'll also see changes in menstruation, quite common, uh, skin and nails. Any symptom can be tied into it with tie, tied into it. There's usually one of those. And a quick clinical pearl, it's rarely all of those. So I see it a lot to where a clinician can suspect a thyroid problem and say, yeah, but this gal skinny as a rail. You know, how could that possibly be? That's really common. It's almost like you got a deck of a dozen cards of symptoms and you get shuffled out maybe one, two, maybe three cards, but you don't get all the cards. So when we look at these labs, a lot of times they'll be within the range. But Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about that tighter range versus the broader range. For sure. So there's been a lot of data points saying that if you grab a bunch of people and just like completely screen them thoroughly for any thyroid issues um, in terms of symptoms, family history, meds that could mess up the thyroid, you name it, and then you average their scores, it doesn't look like the normal reference range. And the single biggest discrepancy is with the TSH scores. Healthy people have some diversity of T3 levels. They've got some diversity of T4 levels. And those two are actually lagging indicators. So the body works hard to buffer T3 and T4 until it can't. So they're like the last places to go extreme when there's problems that are present. But the TSH, you know, it's a backward indicator. So the lower it is, the more there's an excess. The higher it is, there's more of a deficiency. 
Right. When I started practicing, normal was considered up to 10 or 12 based upon the lab's reference range. Now, most say four and a half is the upper limit. But when you look at people with no thyroid problems, it's more like two, maybe two and a half. And also then, when we look at those with thyroid disease, and we segment them for their TSH, and we look at their symptomology, their comorbidities, their long-term health outcomes, we see the same thing, that those who are normal, but on the low side of it, they're healthier, they have fewer comorbidities, and they're, they're less symptomatic. So, so that's the biggest single discrepancy between normal and what we call optimal. This episode is sponsored by Zuckerman Future Technologies. Their Remy laser is a class four laser for professionals. It is different from anything available on the market in that it is a lightweight, four pounds, and compact but powerful device. Its large touchscreen makes it easy to use, and it has multiple wavelengths of 650, 810, and 980 nanometers, power variables up to 30 watts, and a safety rating that make it optimal for many conditions. With the Remy laser, you can give your patients effective, pain-free treatment of soft tissue issues. It is ideal for treating plantar fasciitis, fasciopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, peripheral neuropathy, neuromas, arthritis, onychomycosis, warts, and more. It is the only laser with FDA 510K approval and insurance coverage. Zuckerman Future Technology deals with all aspects of the Remy in-house, and this keeps out the middleman, which allows them to offer this revolutionary device at a 40% reduced price compared to anything that can provide the similar results. There are currently over 700 Remy lasers being used in the USA and Europe, and those numbers are rising every day. Learn more about this fantastic product and join the growing number of professionals who are benefiting from having the Remy in their practice. I personally implemented the Remy into my practice about four years ago, and I cannot say enough about the utility, versatility, and efficacy that I have seen with this technology. I can also say that of all the capital equipment that I have purchased, and it has been a lot over the last 36 years, this is one of the best expenditures I have made. Zuckerman Future Technologies is offering the listeners of the Pod of Inquiry a really great deal. You'll get a $1,000 cart for the Remy Laser when you use code 007. That's right, a $1,000 cart for the Remy Laser just for bona fide Pod of Inquiry spelunkers. You can go to the website, remylaser.com, plug in your James Bond code of 007, and get your free cart with a purchase of the Remy. So aside from the uh, the autoimmune phenomena of Hashimoto's, is there, like with everything else, I mean, I've, I've had glutathione experts on already. I've got, you know, a great podcast on nitric oxide. And it seems like all of these wonderful molecules that we make, as we age, we just lose our ability. Now, one, uh, one of my colleagues who's an internist feels that everyone over 60 years of age uh, is deficient in thyroid, albeit it may be minimal, but that, and I don't know if that's true or not, but empirically, it would seem that as we get older, maybe that's why we're getting tired a little more. Maybe that's why our muscles are a little more sore when we do the weekend warrior thing. Uh, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, age is a big driver, a big relative factor behind thyroid disease. You know, age, gender, and iodine status past those three everything else combined is not as relevant. <laughs> so, right. so age, mm -hmm. yeah, the question is how much that's an inevitable change and how much that's a cumulative change. So if there's something that's not working right for a year versus something not working right for 20 years, 20 years, you know, 20 times more likely to manifest a problem. Like you right. roll the dice enough times, you'll get snake eyes. So we think it's more a matter of if there are low-grade stressors on the thyroid, it's just their cumulative impact. What do you think you... You made the comment that thyroid cancers are increasing. Do you think that's more environmental toxin, or do you think that what would you as ascribe the physiology there to to the derangement of that that cellular structure in the thyroid? Yeah. So, like other versions of thyroid disease, we know some genetic connections, some genetic risks. As far as controllable factors and things we know about that actually give rise to it. Iodine is one of the largest single ones there as well. So especially for the more common papillary cancers. 
the more rare medullary cancers that probably more so genetic, but 80 to 90% are papillary. And we do know that excess iodine exposure is a big driver of them. So I guess we, we look at these labs, we, we pray that they're within the narrow range and hopefully, you know, they'll get your book and get that table that'll show them what the narrow range is. But then you, you send them off to endocrinology and, and I'm not, uh, trying to educate folks in our profession necessarily to treat thyroid, but I think the more you have an understanding of it and the more you have a, um, well, really an understanding and the more you can educate your patient and then get them to endocrinology or internal medicine so that they can dial them up to help us treat what we're treating. Uh, so can you comment a little bit about the treatment of T4 versus T3? Because I thought that was interesting in your book. Sure. And we can talk too about just treatment overall and you know when is medication helpful, when is lifestyle effective. So yeah, so the thyroid makes primarily... T4, about like 80-90%. The remainder is T3. Those ratios do vary. The thyroid can fluctuate how much of each it puts out. And then a fair amount of T4 is converted into T3 in the periphery. The bulk of it's made into reverse T3. That's actually got some important roles to play by itself. So the question is, at what point is T4 monotherapy the, the best option? And when can someone do better with combination therapy that can include T3? And this is an interesting one. T4 monotherapy has a lot of advantages in terms of medication availability and you know, reimbursement and whatnot. But there have been a couple of good studies showing that even when blinded, people subjectively, many do better on combination therapy. And there's good reasons for that. We know there's some genotypes that have a harder time peripherally converting T4 into T3. So some people simply don't have a good enough amount of the active hormones without taking some of each. There's also a story for T2 as well. And that's a perk about natural thyroid. It contains T4, T3, and T2. Now, T2, it's uh, diodothyronine. Is that? Yep. Diodothyrosine. Yeah, yeah. Di- yeah. Yeah. They all have really weird names. It's kind of like <laughs> di- dinosaurs or something. But anyhow, <laughs> T2 is, is, is pretty important in uh, metabolism, fat burning. Is that, is that correct? It's pretty interesting. Back before we had uh, current drug treatments, We've always known the strong link between thyroid hormone and cholesterol. And so for a long time, researchers said, hey, is there some kind of a thyroid analog that will lower cholesterol but not induce hyperthyroidism? And T2 is studied quite a bit for that. And yeah, it actually does have effects upon lowering cholesterol and benefiting basal metabolic rate. Eventually, it will act as a thyroid hormone, so we can't just take it indiscriminately. But those who do lack thyroid output oftentimes do lack it as well. So if we go into the ancestral living uh, model where people would eat desiccated meats and those types of things, I think, you know, maybe I've got this wrong, but isn't that one of the, the ways you can treat this is with thyroid tissue itself? You know, the earliest days of identifying it, it was called thyroid feeding. And it was probably yeah. something like what we call what the, the tiger's meat now or the steak tartare and yeah. And they, they didn't have a sense how to dose it very well. It was tough to calibrate it, but that was a treatment way back when. Yeah, I thought I looked at that. And we're talking when the when we're talking about thyroid stuff, you're talking micrograms, which is a really, really small amount. You made a great analogy in your book about the swimming pool. Yeah. Take an Olympic pool and drop a teaspoon of vanilla extract in there. And that's about the concentration of thyroid hormones in the blood. They're they're that powerful. But yeah, thyroid hormones and iodine. Not much else is that relevant to the microgram quantity. You know, we got a, a paper clip is a gram, a grain of salt is a milligram, and a thousandth of a grain of salt is a microgram. Wow. So to go from a microgram to a gram is like going from a paper clip to a, an adult Holstein cow. <laughs> wow. So yeah, infinitesimal and exacting. And that's why for both of these things, for thyroid hormones and iodine, that there's a narrow window. The body needs just the right amount. It's very easy to get too much or too little. I would think that it's um, more on, you know, it's in everything. I mean, we look at our ferritin levels and, you know, I I personally have a high ferritin. I have to do some therapeutic phlebotomy now and then to get the ferritin level down. But if you look, iron is in everything. They put iron in bread. They put it in pretty much everything that's a processed food, which I try to avoid. But but that being said- Iron or- Iron, iron, iodine, iron, 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 yeah. And so 
iron, I mean, there's even a video on YouTube where they crush up some cereal and put a magnet above it and you can see the <laughs> iron coming up. It's like, holy right. cow, I'm eating that. Um, but I, I think the similar thing is with the iodine. I would think it'd be a much harder thing to get too little than too much in today's day and age. You're exactly right. Uh, doctors ask a lot when I talk about the benefits of lowering iodine. They say, well, what about those who are iodine deficient? I'm like, yeah, good point. It's a concern. We've had six cases in the U.S. since 1980. <laughs> it's, it's not right. a really plausible thing. It's <laughs> and you can measure the iodine level, right, with urine testing? Well, you can, but it's a tricky thing. So it's something that it, there's so much variation from, from sample to sample. They've done many papers showing how many samples you got to do to be in the ballpark. If you do 10, you're within about 80%. <laughs> if you oh. get four or five, you're in like 60%. So okay. I, I, they have some value to get, mostly I use them to see if someone has reached a therapeutic excretion level. So if someone's trying to cut their iodine out, then you can use a test after they've done that for a few months to see if there's likely still some getting into their body or not. But the tests don't really show exactly how much they're consuming on a nutritional level. So you said there was six cases of, of demonstrably di uh, iodine deficiency. That's, I guess you could draw from that, that we just ought to assume we have too much. You know, and there's a distinction between being low in iodine and actually being iodine deficient. So okay. in a population like the U.S., we've got somewhere around uh, per demographic, 10% or so that's categorized as low as iodine per the group's excretion levels. But what we're seeing now is that the actual level of iodine deficiency, meaning a demonstrable problem that resolves by adding in iodine, that's a very different thing. And yeah, that's extremely rare. So obviously, I mean, when I looked at your, your different tables and how much uh, iodine is in some of these foods that we consume, that we, we really believe they're very healthy. Uh, the average person that doesn't have a thyroid condition must be able to tolerate those higher levels more so than the poor folks that get thyroid disease, right? Yep, spenders and savers. So the right. spenders, everyone needs as an adult probably like 20 to 50 micrograms per day as a baseline intake. And like you said, that's pretty easy to hit. Uh, as far as the, the tolerance, many people genetically can tolerate probably up to 1,100 micrograms per day on occasion with really no adverse effect. But those who are the savers who hold on to it, they probably don't tolerate much above 200 micrograms per day. The only way oh. to know for sure which of those as you are is to see if you get thyroid disease or not. You know, I, or too late. I, I'm cautious of it. <laughs> yeah. So what's the, you talked about the wolf Chaikoff effect. What, yeah. is, what is that? Explain it to us. It's fascinating. So because we need so much, we tolerate so little, We've got that pump built in, and the pump has a fuse. Uh, for example, we just had a lot of stories about uh, people talking about taking iodine to prevent against radiation fallout if we had some nuclear war. Right. So the reason that can benefit is because when you take iodine, you stop your thyroid from absorbing iodine. You totally shut the gate. You put so much coming in, it shuts it off. You know, you overload your circuits and the fuse breaks. It's the exact same thing. Now, what we've learned in the recent past, we used to think that it was kind of more like a fuse in that it was binary. It was on or off. Now we know it's probably more like a rheostat and that chronic excess can cause like driving with the parking brake on, just like a little bit of inhibition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a way that it balances if there's too much exposure? Yeah, it doesn't work flawlessly, you know, and, and, and it can cause just that ongoing suppression. So along with iodine driving autoimmunity, it can also just slow the thyroid from working. It can cause that hypothyroid state. For some people, they just don't do it effectively. And in those cases, it's what's called iodine-induced hyperthyroidism. Basically, the extra iodine just gets processed and the gland never compensates by shutting down and too much hormone comes out. So we like to think about things in biochemistry and human physiology as single axes, right? You've got your HPA axis and you, you, know, you have all of these other different you know, processes, but they all interreact. And it's it's not like you can just dissect out thyroid because we know that thyroid interacts with other hormones, particularly, you know, adrenal hormones. And um, so what's your thoughts on 
the patient with thyroid disorder and some type of adrenal impairment. That that would seem to be high to me. Yeah, and by the adrenal impairment, we can think about overt disease like Addison's or Cushing syndromes. Those are rather rare. We can also think more about like HPA dysfunction. You brought up the HPA axis. So the body has this central autonomic regulatory system that controls a lot via being in fight or flight or feed and breed. And people can not have overt disease per se, but they've had a chronic cumulative stress load as such to where they can't move out of the stress state very readily. They're in a chronic low-grade state of stressor. And what that does is it takes away so many circadian functions of the body. You know, almost anything you can think of has a circadian pattern to it. And the cortisol is kind of like the conductor of the band. So we make a spike of cortisol when we wake, we shut it down. Relative to thyroid hormone, that dictates when hormones are released, how much they're released, and also how permeable cell membranes are to the hormone. So if there's not that healthy cortisol slope, there may not be a good secretion or uptake of thyroid hormone. So you pointed out in your book about the interplay between insulin and thyroid. Um, Tell me a little bit about that interplay because I have a follow-up question I want to get to with uh, some of the people that we see that are very hyperinsulinemic. But expand on that a little bit if you could. Uh, yeah, so the connection there is is really liver function and glycogen storage. So we have different different fates for fuel. You know, we can store fuel in rather harmless places like in uh, subcutaneous adipose tissue, or it could get jammed in some of the worst places like inside the cells of the pancreas. And the balance of thyroid hormones is one of the biggest factors that shows the body's overall fuel state, if it's a deficit or an excess. The more we get into a fuel excess, the more the body fights fuel and puts it into more harmful places. So insulin resistance is something that's, it's actually, a, if we didn't have that, we'd be worse off because the fuel would quickly go to places that it shouldn't go. But it's, a, it's an adaptive mechanism to kind of close those doors and make it harder for fuel to get taken up when there's already an overload. So you commented a little bit about the keto diet and its relationship, how, and maybe I got this wrong when I read it, but that you wanted to be careful that you didn't suppress the insulin too much, right? Is that- it's a funny thing. Uh, insulin has been thought of as a villain in some contexts, and we, we, we need some. We know that when there's too little of it, the body can go into a mode as if starvation is occurring. And oddly, that could happen even if there's not a fuel deficit. So you could consume more than the day's caloric need purely in the state of fat, and you can gain weight just fine on that, but that can cause insulin to get quite low. And if insulin is too low, that causes the body to centrally inhibit thyroid hormone secretion, but also lower thyroid activation. I haven't seen a patient yet with too little insulin. Yeah. Uh, You know, I mean, they're very hyperinsulinemic. A lot of times they'll come in and they'll say, I'm not a diabetic. I I don't have type 2 diabetes and my A1C was 5.5. And then you you send them out, you get a fasting serum insulin, a fasting serum glucose, and their insulin comes back at 35. You know, I mean... That, that's much more typical. Yeah. yeah. And then, There are some enthusiasts who are keto or extreme low carb, but, but as far as typical people, you're totally right. Well, and I think the point you made was very good is that, you know, there is, you know, as with anything, dosage is very important. You have to have insulin, but you don't have to be hyperinsulinemic because we know that puts you know so I, there is a Definitely. sweet spot just like you talked about with uh with all of the hormones um specifically the uh thyroid hormones so let's talk about the diet because you you've got some great recipes in there uh i guess my first question is how hard is it for somebody to go on this diet and and maintain it but why don't you just give an overall view on the diet cuz i think it's really you know great you know, we've had three pretty big studies now looking at uh, undefined hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, subclinical hypothyroidism. And what they showed is that by deliberately lowering iodine, um, this is a broad state, a, a, bland, a bold statement to make, but the disease reversed in, in many studies. So one of the classic studies was on Hashimoto's, and they took people that had average TSH scores of 14.1. They had had thyroid disease for about four and a half years overall, and they were pretty much stable at that level. They were not in a good way and they weren't undergoing a lot of fluctuation. 
they did no medication, uh, no lifestyle, nothing else, just this iodine regulation. And they could have been more thorough. There are some sources that I would argue that could have been missed out on. But within three months, 78.3% of participants had totally normalized thyroid levels, just perfectly normal. That number, if that's all that there was, I'd be happy with that. But of those that didn't get better, a large percent of them either weren't compliant or they did improve quite a bit, but they weren't yet normalized. So if we reframe the question to say, of those who were compliant, how many reversed disease or saw a big improvement? That number was about 95% from the particular study. So and that incredibly was, dramatic. That was within three months. That was within three months. Okay. Yeah. And your diet, you start them off on uh, the first phase that's a little bit more rigorous, kind of like your bolus, so to speak. And uh, mm -hmm. then you put them in a maintenance phase. You want to talk about that a little bit? For sure. So the, the first phase I call the reset phase, and that's targeting a daily intake of somewhere below 100 micrograms, just like the study. And once then someone achieves normal thyroid function, they benefited their symptoms, there's every expectation that they've got more window of tolerance. Basically, it takes a really large gradient of iodine to get the extra amounts out of the thyroid because it almost only leaves the thyroid via thyroid hormone. And when someone's hypothyroid and or on meds, there's not a lot of hormone coming out. So you need a pretty big gradient to clear that excess. But once you do and you reverse the disease, you've got some more leeway. So I call that the maintenance phase. And that gives a range of between about like 50 to 200 micrograms, gives more food options. So when you start them off in the reset phase of the diet, how, how long does that, um, about, I can't remember the, the amount of time, yeah, the set time is really based on someone's own goals, but a typical duration is between about like three to nine months. Okay, so that's they have to be willing to commit to this. I mean, they have to get the big picture and say, okay, I'm buying in and I'm going to do it. But I think if they understand that, hey, these cells can regenerate, that's a, you know, and does everybody believe that now in mainstream medicine or is it still once you're there, that's all you got? You know, I got to say, it's it's just stymied me how strong this data is and how little it's been taken up. I mean, this this could be first-line therapy for thyroid disease. The other big data point we're seeing is that for so many people, even if they're hypothyroid, reversing the hypothyroidism of medications doesn't always resolve the problems. That's gotten more clear. But yet we see that there are dietary options that can work. Well, maybe it's because it's not a drug and they can charge a lot for it, you know? Um, you know, in, in some way, taking the hormone is not the same as making it in this context. Right, right. So they do the reset for three to nine months, and obviously that's going to be dependent upon how severe their condition is. Then you go into the maintenance phase. The maintenance phase, you had some really nice recipes in there. Um, it's like, wow, this is kind of a cool cookbook. Uh, <laughs> do you... Do you practice this diet periodically? I mean, obviously, you're pretty much the paragon of health. I know you've known you for a long time. You exercise, <laughs> you, you take care of yourself. You're not the smoking pulmonologist, let's put it that way. <laughs> but uh, uh, people that are in real good shape, doing what they're supposed to do, they're exercising, they're eating well, properly, they're you know doing all of the, the, the pillars of, of health. What's your take? integrate this every now and then or you know personally i don't have thyroid disease but i do follow the maintenance guidelines you know I, I, i'm aware of the foods that can have a lot of iodine and the other sources that can be high of that and i really do avoid those things yeah i don't want to develop it yeah well it's a lot easier to pre uh, it's always easier to prevent the disease than to treat the disease mm -hmm. now is there any implementation of this diet in patients who have uh the misfortune of having thyroid cancer is this um not a lot of data either way there is epidemiologic data about risk of developing it but as far as treating existing cancer no strong data either way on that because you would think empirically if you're going through chemo and you're well you don't really go through chemo do you they just radiate the iodine and take it out i mean it's a pretty treatable cancer but it would seem to me that you would empirically want to try to make your thyroid healthier if you could during that period of time. 
You know, the other part of that is that in almost all those cases, someone is losing their thyroid, they're going on medications. And you mentioned the wolf chaikoff effect. So that's relevant in terms of how the body responds and makes its own hormone. But it also has relevance to how someone responds to exogenous thyroid hormone, you know, from medication. So when someone needs to go on it, if they have these radical occasional boluses of iodine, that can also make their treatment less stable and predictable. So, so it is still useful in that, in that sense. Interesting. Anything else that we need to know about thyroid, Alan? One high-level idea about the diet is just that it's really not very hard. There's a lot right. of extremely restrictive diets you can find that are out there. And what I've found is that any category of foods you could think of, there's some safe, low iodine options. Some things are obvious, like seaweed or iodized salt. But there's a handful of items that are kind of unpredictable, but there's really easy workarounds. So if somebody's on a standard diet, uh, generally healthy food, you know, paleo, vegan, whatever, you can do all those things and regulate iodine along the way. It's quite simple and yeah, huge payoff. See, I was a little disappointed when I read that the egg yolk was the, uh, was the uh, iodine carrier and that has all the choline in it. And uh, so you got to give one up to get the other. It's, uh, it's a tough balance sometimes. Yeah, I, those who are on reset phases, it's probably worth supplementing with choline. It's it's rel- relatively helpful, conditionally essential micronutrients. Totally agree with you. Once someone's on maintenance stage, they can add those back in. But there's a couple things like that that if I had a magic wand, they wouldn't have turned out that way. But <laughs> right, right. I was a little bit disappointed when I saw the Himalayan salt. It's like ah, uh, well, I gotta gotta correct that one. But um, so. <sighs> I want to thank you for coming on today, and this is very valuable information. How how can folks find you? I'm going to put a lot of this in the show notes, obviously, and your books that they can. I would assume you can buy them, off, you know, Amazon or whatnot. How do they get a hold of your products? Uh, I take. I still use your Adrenal Reset Shake. In fact, I had one the, this morning. It, it's great. How do they get in touch with uh, with that? You know, easiest thing is drchristensen.com. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Dr. Christensen.com. That's the hub of everything. Before we that. get off, I've got yeah. to talk about you super briefly. So your listeners know you and they love you and they're following you, but they got to hear a little bit more about behind the scenes. Uh, I, in my issues of seizures, I, I, I was part of that, but I was always badly coordinated. I had a lot of issues with my ankles rolling all along. And I had the odd combination of a good engine and a horrible chassis. <laughs> I've got a good cardiorespiratory system and I could never meet my potential of that. I was always injuring and chronic recurrent ankle issues. And I had spent 17 years of struggling with chronic heel pain and never resolving that, trying everything under the sun. And finally connected with Dr. Barrett, found you from seeing some of your work. You happen to be local, which was great. I would have traveled if you weren't. But uh, four surgeries and some little bit of time later, for the first time in my life, I'm not limited by my feet. So it's been the most profound thing, and I couldn't be more thankful for that. Well, I appreciate those kind words. It's always great to uh, for me to have patients like you because I, I end up learning so much more than I can impart. But uh, um, it's been great. I'll put your uh, website in the, uh, the show notes, and uh, you're always welcome. If you want to come back and talk about thyroid again i'm well you know i would welcome that uh but you have so many maybe we need to get you on and talk about chelation because you helped me out with that back in the day i had really high lead and really high mercury um and I, I, that was like a crazy insidious thing you know you would never think you know and i i really didn't eat that much paint when i was a kid um <laughs> but uh we'll have to get you back on and talk about some other things i mean you got weight loss other- is a fun topic yeah yeah, yeah. Are you doing anything in the peptide world now? That seems to be an emerging uh, hot area of discussion. Yeah, keeping an eye on things. I've not a lot of relevance to my areas of focus just yet. So yeah, staying staying in the lane mostly. Interesting. Yeah, I've got an interview uh, with um, a couple of peptide experts, and they're you know looking at all of these different conditions. It's really very interesting. But uh, Alan, thank you so much. I appreciate you. I, taking the time. I know how busy you are. It was great for me just to see you and catch up with you. I've, <laughs> I've missed you just, uh, you know, as a as somebody to have great human interaction with. So thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, likewise. Fun, fun to see you, Steve. All right. Be well. All right. You too. All right. Bye-bye. I hope you all enjoyed today's show and got some truly empowering knowledge out of it. 
You can always follow up on anything we talked about in the show notes found at our website, podofinquiry.com. If you think you might have tickled just a few neurons inside that cerebral cortex, please spread the word to your friends and colleagues and tell them that they need to get spelunking. Also, if you can take a minute to leave a review on your podcast provider of choice, and especially Apple Podcasts, that would greatly help the show and be so appreciated, provided it's positive. And if not, then just keep your pie holes shut and stay down in that cave. Let's keep Spelunky. This podcast is designed for informational purposes only. It does not constitute any medical or surgical consulting advice or imply a development of any physician-patient relationship. The opinions of guests who are featured on the show are not necessarily the opinions of Dr. Barrett or the production team. This podcast is owned solely by Barrett Medical and Surgical Media, LLC. While the show is highly oriented for physicians and healthcare providers, anyone interested in the improvement of human performance and understanding will find us a welcome goblet to sip from or guzzle. However, no representation or warranties are made in any way whatsoever on this podcast for any products, techniques, or other things discussed. Invited guests are not vetted by the pod of inquiry for their qualifications and may have a direct or indirect financial interest in what they present and discuss on the show. The Pond of Inquiry disclaims any responsibility from anything taken from the show and used personally or professionally. It is a responsibility of the listener to perform their own due diligence prior to the implementation of any ideas, products, techniques, or anything talked about on the show.